So one, uh, one Saturday morning, my, my cell phone rang at 7 a.m. And there's only one person on this planet who calls me at that ungodly hour. And uh, that's my mother. Now, by way of context, my mother is 89 years old. For 75 of those years, she has smoked a pack of Pall Malls every single day. She has successfully avoided exercise and she eats bacon with impunity. She is a force of nature. So this is what I hear on the phone. Your sister tells me you're writing a book about the angiogram. So I said, look, I am not writing a book on the angiogram. I'm writing a book on the Enneagram. And she says, what's the Enneagram? (laughs) So I gave her my, uh, my kind of my elevator pitch. I said, well, the Enneagram's an ancient personality typing system that helps people understand who they are, why they think, feel, and act the way that they do, and helps them understand who they are at their best and who they are at their worst. So then there was this like long, utterly silent, airless sound on the other end of the phone. And finally my mother says, forget the Enneagram, write a book about going to heaven and coming back. Those authors make money. (laughs) So my mom's suggestion that I forgo writing a book about the Enneagram made me really begin to question doing it. I mean, what possible reason could a sane human being come up with for writing a book about an old personality typing system whose name sounds suspiciously like the pentagram? (laughs) But here's why I did it. For centuries, great Christian teachers have insisted that we cannot really know God until we first know ourselves. Now that's a radical idea. Augustine prayed, Lord, let me know myself that I may know thee. Calvin said, without knowledge of self, There is no knowledge of God. And I know from firsthand experience that this is true and that the Enneagram is one of the best tools and only one tool, only one tool of many that can help us accomplish this task. So what's it all about? For those of you who don't know, the Enneagram is a 16 hundred year old personality typology. It suggests that there are nine core personality types in the world and it offers an in-depth and uncannily accurate, creepy accurate at times, description of each of those types. But that's just the psychology of it. The early teachers who developed the Enneagram saw that each of the nine types had a particular weakness for one of the seven deadly sins that Pope Gregory I came up with, pride, envy, gluttony, lust, anger, greed, sloth. And then someone added fear and deceit to the list so no one would feel left out. And obviously we're all capable of committing every single one of those deadly sins, but let's be honest, there's one that always trips us up, always one. Take an inventory of all of your little and not so little moral failures over the course of your lifetime and you'll recognize a very uncreative pattern. Most of our misdeeds are just variations of the the same theme of our particular type's deadly sin. So listen, if you don't know your particular thorn in the flesh, the sin that besets you, trust me, it has complete autonomy 
to do whatever it wants in your life. So let me just run you very quickly through nine of those types. Put your seatbelt on. So type ones are called the perfectionists. They feel a need to perfect the world. But when their deadly sin of anger takes hold of them and activates, they begin to exude a smoldering resentment and a spirit of judgment towards themselves and others. Type twos are the helpers. They're motivated by a need to meet the needs of others. But when their sin of pride takes hold, they begin to believe that they alone know what's best for other people. Threes are called the performers. These are folks that are motivated by a need to succeed. But in their headlong rush for success, they often will don a mask, a mask that will impress the crowd. And in the process, they deceive not only the crowd, but themselves into believing they are their false persona. We'll come back to four as the number that's most like Jesus in a moment. So type fives, type fives are called the investigators. They're motivated by, uh, motivated by a need to hoard vast amounts of knowledge to avoid looking inept. And their, their sin of avarice comes into play when they greedily begin to hold not just information, but love and affection from others. Type sixes, oh, their deadly sin is fear. They're motivated by a need to feel secure. And when that, that deadly sin activates, sixes turn to authority figures or belief systems rather than God to provide them with the security they yearn for. Sevens, one of my favorites, like Stephen Colbert, for example, they're motivated by a need to avoid psychological and emotional pain. And the way gluttony reveals itself in their lives is in the way they gorge themselves on positive experiences and planning great new escapades to sidestep facing distressing emotions. Eight, my mother is an eight. They're motivated by a need to assert strength, be in control and avoid feeling weak or vulnerable. And the, their deadly sin of lust can be seen in the excessiveness they evidence in every area of their lives. And finally, nines, oh, nines, the peacemakers, they're motivated by a need to avoid conflict at all costs. And their sin of sloth doesn't refer to, you know, physical laziness, but spiritual laziness. They avoid asserting themselves, developing themselves and becoming their own person. Now I am a four. We are the individualists. We have a need to feel special and unique. If you've ever seen the movie Wuthering Heights, there's a scene where Catherine and Heathcliff, the main characters, they've got their noses pressed against the glass and they're looking in on a party going on at their neighbor's house. And from the plaintive expressions on their faces, you know, as they're looking in, they're saying to themselves, why can I not become, why can I not be invited to the party of life? Why am I a misfit? stuck on the aisle of the misfit of toys. Their deadly sin is envy because they feel like they're missing something inside that everybody else has except for them. This past summer, my daughter got married and my mom was there. And one night I happened to spot my book in her room on her bed as I was going out to the closing party of the, uh, of the event. And uh, I had a moment to tell her, my 90 year old, almost 90 year old mom, I love you and I'm so glad you're here. Now my mom isn't very expressive, but when I walked out and got about 50 yards from the cabana where we were staying, I heard the door open and I heard my mother say, I love you. You are a great son. And she has never said that to me before. She had started to do her work. 
you and I owe it to ourselves, to the world, and to the church to develop the kind of self-knowledge that will also raise up a spring of self-compassion and compassion to a world that is broken. And I invite you on that great journey. Thank you.